opposite reaction. For instance, past week, I got bit by an insect and I reacted. My arms swell. I didn't need a floaty to go in the water. It was like that kind of thing. That action of the bite led to the reaction of the swelling that led me to the doctor's office for the medicine. All right? In sports, there is an action-reaction thing. I love baseball. You guys know that. And in baseball, managers, um, they, they have a plan. When they have a right-handed pitcher, they want a right-handed pitcher to face a right-handed batter because then the advantage goes to the pitcher. So the, the action of putting in a right-handed pitcher often leads the other manager to react and put in a left-handed batter to go against them. You follow me here? One action leads to a reaction. In school, students, when you hear there's an exam coming next week, that action of hearing about an exam should lead to the reaction of preparing for it. If you hear of a hurricane coming, that action often leads the stock market to react. And insurance companies tend to lose a little there because they're anticipating them having to pay out. When you hear the action of someone saying that LeBron James is the best basketball player ever, it leads to the reaction of you saying this person is too young to be a Actions lead to reactions. When we see what's going on in our headlines and we see the actions in our nation, what kind of reactions does that put in your heart? Just last Sunday, I was telling us about the El Paso shooting and then even that morning as I was speaking, uh, we were hearing the news of the Dayton shooting. You know, there's been 17 at least mass murders in our country. Over 100 casualties in 2019 alone. What do those actions do in terms of your reaction? When we hear of migrant workers being arrested in the workplace and kids at school then not having parents that they're coming home to, what do those actions do to you as a reaction? It should at the very least cause us to empathize and hurt for children, right? You see, there are things that take place in our land, laws that are being put in place, different ideas that are being put forward that should lead the church to react. And the church's reaction should be, first and foremost, to pray. You with me? Amen. But let me take this another notch. The action of prayer should lead to the reaction of what? You see, the problems in our land, the actions in our land should lead to the reaction of prayer. But what does the action of prayer lead to the reaction of? You see, the Bible tells us that God is a God who does not stand passively by. And he is eager for us as people to take the action of prayer so that he, according to the way he has designed it, can react in his own assertive sovereign will. The action of prayer leads to the reactions of God. But what do God's reactions look like? See, family, if we know that God responds to prayer, shouldn't that all the more reason cause to pray? Yes. Prayer is a beautiful gift that God has given to all of us. It's something that he summons us to take part in. And the Bible tells us time and time again that God responds to prayer. Yeah, he's sovereign, he's in control, he has a plan, and you know, a lot of times his will, we don't understand how that all works out. How God can be sovereign, knows the future, and yet, in his own way, it responds to prayer that he has already sovereignly planning to respond to. Prayer changes things, and oftentimes what most of it does is change our hearts and our posture toward God. You see, we know a lot about prayer. We know that it's important to pray. We ask people to pray for us. We know the Bible talks about prayer. You might be reminded that Jesus' disciples, the one thing they asked Jesus to teach them is how to pray. But a lot of times we don't remember the reaction. The reaction to prayer. What is God? How does He respond to prayer? To that, I want us to look at a passage in the Bible from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. You can, would you meet me in the Bible at that passage? If you don't own a Bible, there's one there in the chair in front of you. It's blue. Uh, meet me on page 364. And we're going to find what, what reaction of God follows our actions of prayer. Would you rise to your feet and get ready to read this passage if you're able to? Second Chronicles, chapter 7. You don't often hear a sermon from the book of Chronicles, by the way. 
It's one of those books in the Bible that are kind of unfamiliar to us, but there are gems in there. And this passage is one of those. Follow with me as I read verses 11 through 16. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And then he says here in verse 13, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locust to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Can you say turn from their wicked ways? Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. And do this, Lord Jesus. Heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. Let's pray together, family, as I open this message. Father, Lord, we know that we live in a broken nation as beautiful as this nation is. Lord, we know that we live in a broken city as much as we love Chicago. God, we know that we are broken people as much as they might be good. And so, Father, we come before you today with a very simple request for that, Lord, you would heal us. God, would you indeed also teach us to pray today? God, I pray that you would move in each of us here today, Lord, no matter where we're at in the spectrum of faith, and that you would impress upon us, God, the beauty and importance of prayer, and stir us to be women of prayer, men of prayer, young people of prayer, God. Let us be marked, God, by an utter dependency upon you. And let that dependency be made so clearly seen through prayer. So, Father, I pray that you would cut through anything in our hearts, Lord, that would lead us away from you, and you would woo us back as you are so much to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This passage in the Bible comes during an interesting time in Israel's history. As I mentioned in verse, as I read in verse 11, King Solomon builds a temple in the land of Israel. And if you know Israel's history, son, you might not be aware of this, but when Solomon was the king, was when Israel, God's people, were experiencing an unparalleled kind of prosperity in their nation. They were like seeing things as good as they get. There was peace in the land, there was financial prosperity in the land, there was technological advancement in the land. Things were good. And to cap it off, Solomon built the temple that God said, I would dwell in, I will make my presence known in this place. It was a time of great prosperity. But what we see in Israel's time is that in times of prosperity, our greatest foe is self-reliance. Are you with me here? In times of prosperity, our greatest foe is self-reliance. Self-reliance leads to pride, and as I said last week, pride is like the summer. It comes before the fall. And so, in Israel's time, Solomon is here having built his temple, and God's like, let me pump the brakes for you for just a moment. Let me put something on your radar. Because things are good now, and I know the track record of humanity is that when things are good, people have a way of turning away from me, the giver of all good things. God's like, let, let me let you know something. If you should turn away from me, hardship will follow you. Family, 
is that look at our nation right now. We, we live in a wonderful country. It has a flawed history. We know this. But it has some wonderful things in our history. God has used people from this nation to go across this world to tell people about Jesus, to come to the aid of those in need. Many wonderful things. But there is brokenness here, family. We are a nation who is experiencing prosperity. And what we have been is bit by the bug of self-reliance. And pride has begun to well up in our hearts. And we look to others other than to God for our answers. And God's like, look here. I told you before in my word. As you turn away from me in my grace and mercy, I'm going to put my hand on the land. And it's a warning that God gives. He tells his people here, Israel, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, verse 13, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Notice here, God's like, look, when natural disaster strikes the land, don't think it's because God is not present, but I need you to know when trials come to the land, it's not because I'm not involved, but it's because I am involved. God's like, look, hardship comes to the land because the land often has turned away from me. He tells them this when things are good. And what follows then is God giving a direction of prayer for his people. One commentator says that the passage that follows is a sure road to restoration and revival for all time. If you're like me, I long for revival in our nation. I long for God to bring something that's never been here. A kind of unity and healing that's focused on Jesus and not ourselves, not on our own desires, but on God's desire. I desire revival in Chicago, family. There are wonderful churches in our city. And just as many as there are great churches, there's also many broken communities. We need revival. Church family, we need revival in this church. Brook family, I love you guys. I know we have love for one another. But let us not be deceived to think that everything's always good. We know it's not. I wake up in the morning, I'm like, Lord, I'm a pastor, but I need revival. What about the sheep in this church that you lead, God? Family, we need revival. And for us to understand that here in this passage, we have a sure road for restoration and revival for all times. That should cause our ears to perk up a little bit. So when we're caught up in sin as a nation, when the consequences of our actions are piling up in front of us as individuals, here God lays out a pathway to come back to Him. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what it is that makes you feel far from God today. I don't know what choices you've made that have clearly severed and fractured your fellowship with God. But I want you to know that today, God has provided a way back to Him. Amen. And that way back is found in verse 14. This is what God tells Solomon in a vision. He says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. This is what he starts out with. It's an if clause. See, when we see an if clause in the Bible, we got to look for the then. It's a conditional statement. If one thing is true, then another thing will follow. If you don't think you're better, then you'll be in trouble, kids, right? If you don't study for an the exam, then you're probably going to fail. See, the if-thens of the Bible are things we got to pay attention to. And we see the if in verse 14. If my people do these things, and then following, then I will do this. But before we get to then, let's look at the if. Let's look at the conditional statement. If my people. See, this is not just a statement for anyone. God is offering this conditional statement for His people. Not just anyone is God's people. This is important here. You're not God's person by an ethnicity. You're not God's child by geography. You're not God's family by your own family heritage. You become God's child, part of his people, through faith in Jesus. And he says, if my people, that's those who put my faith, their faith in me, if my people who are called by my name, notice that, 
call upon my name. See, not only does God say, through faith in Jesus, you can be part of my family, but then you can also be called by my name. This statement, this, this introduction to this conditional clause, family, is beautiful. Because God here, knowing that His children will fall away, start relying on themselves, and that you're still my people, I still call you by my name. Let's remember what God's name is about. He has revealed Himself as the name Yahweh, which means I am who I am, the self-existent one. And then He calls Himself by many nicknames, like Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Jehovah Tsekenu, our righteousness. Jehovah Tsepaol, the Lord of hosts. God's like, this is who I am. And I place my name on my people. I take ownership of them. See, what's so wonderful about our God is no matter how far we stray as his child, he says, my name is stamped on you. So you can come back to me. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what it is that makes you feel far from God. But if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been stamped with God's name. He owns you. You belong to Him. You belong to Him. And conversely, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have not said, God, forgive me, bring me to your family and turn from my sin. You're not God's people. You are not owned by Him. And you're a slave to another. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so what's here is an outline for hope in God. And God says, come to me if you don't know Him. And if you do know the Lord, He says, you are my people. You are called by my name. And this is what I want you to do. And this is what we need to pray for the church in the United States. And not assuming that being in the United States makes us his church. This is not a Christian nation. To be a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus. You become a child of God. That doesn't make us a Christian nation. That's important for us to understand. Because otherwise we might be praying in ways it's not lining up with our or who we are. See, we must be God's child through faith in Him. And this is what God does. He gives us four indispensable qualities of a repentant prayer. Four indispensable qualities. Four things that must typify all of us if we will come back to God. And this is what He says. If my people who are called by my name will first of all humble themselves. Notice that? Humble themselves. I'm interested by the themselves word there. It doesn't say that God would you humble me, but God's like, hey, my people need to make a choice to humble themselves before me. See, pride is holding on to our independence from God. I've said it before, prayerlessness is our declaration of independence from God. Where prayer is our declaration of dependence upon God. And he's saying, my people who want to come back to me must first do so by humbling themselves. If you don't humble yourself, you will highlight yourself. <laughs> if you won't apologize, you won't do so because it's not your fault. You won't be broken because you're out, you've got it all together. And you won't sincerely cry out to God because ultimately you really don't need Him. See, pride has got a face, not even it's God. And so God says, if you will come back to me, family, you got to humble yourself. See, the greatest need in the church, in our city, in our nation, is repentance. And the greatest enemy of repentance is pride. See, in our prosperity, we become self-reliant. we got to remember that pride is like the summer. It comes before the fall. And I want you to ask, what ways are you holding on to your pride today? <coughs> How is your pride preventing you from access to God? God's like, you don't need me. Why will I come to your aid? Mm -hmm. wow. If you're my child, humble yourself. That's the first indispensable quality, the first action of prayer we have, we've got to have. The second one is right there after. My people must humble themselves and pray. It's one thing to be humbled, but it's another thing to say, God, in my humility, I'm going to come to you in prayer. 
It's saying, God, I'm going to speak my heart to you. See, this passage is like God sending a letter to your mailbox. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. It has the right postage. It is there in your mailbox. Not only is it in your mailbox, but it's being opened up before you. And inside is an invitation, a summons to God's presence. And what God is saying even right now is, will you RSVP? Will you come and respond to Him? You see, people throughout the history of the church have come to understand some things beautiful about prayer. I mean, a lot of times we talk about prayer, we get filled with guilt, right? First thing we say is, I don't pray as much as I should pray. You ever been there? And naturally start feeling really guilt-ridden about it. God is a God, I believe, who wants to inspire action in us and not simply guilt us into action. He wants us to see how beautiful prayer is, that we long for Him, instead of saying, I should pray, I feel so bad, let me pray. Because I know, come and see what I'm offering to you. Humble yourselves. So I was looking for quotes of those throughout church history who've come to love and learn prayer. I want to tell you some things that they said about prayer. John Wesley says, prayer is where the action is. I like that. Charles Spurgeon says, If any of you should ask me for an epitome of the Christian religion, I should say it is one word. Prayer. Thomas Watson says, Prayer delights God's ears. It melts his heart. It opens his hand. God cannot deny a praying soul. That's a man who prayed. Beth Moore, she writes this. She says, There are parts of our calling, works of the Holy Spirit, and defeats of the darkness that will come no other way than through furious, fervent, faith-filled, unceasing prayer. That's someone who understands prayer. R.A. Torres said this, when the devil sees a man or a woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray, and who really does pray, not just talks about it, but does pray, and above all, when he sees a whole church on its face before God in prayer, the devil trembles as much as he ever did. For he knows that his day in that church or community is at an end. F.B. Mm -hmm. Meyer says the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Martin Luther says to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's a man who knows that prayer is his breath. A.W. told us that to desire revival and at the same time to neglect personal prayer and devotion is to wish one way and walk another. Or as Leonard Ravenhill said it so well, quit playing and start praying. Quit feasting start fasting. Talk less with men, talk more with God. Listen less to men. Listen to the words of God. Skip travel, start travail. And finally, the words of Corey Ten Boom puts it well as what she said, or she asked, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Mm. And these are people of old and present who come to love prayer. And I read that say, Lord, do that. Do that at the brook. At the brook, we have five core values. And we use them in the word water as our acronym, where the word, the letter W stands for white flag worship. It's a life of surrender. The A stands for always on mission. We are God's missionaries no matter where we go. The T, though, stands for thirsty prayer. The psalmist says in Psalm 42, as a deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O God. The E in our acronym stands for embodying scripture and the R for real community. These things go ablaze through prayer. And God says, if my people will come to me, they first need to humble themselves. Secondly, they gotta just start praying. Family, we, we, we want to make our 945 a.m. prayer gathering this Sunday something where it is magnetic, it is potent. We invite you to join with us. We know not every week that will work out for everyone. But then we got to prioritize prayer yeah. as our part of our longing, as our RSVP to God's Son, come to me in your brokenness. The third thing he says, though, is to seek my face. 
See, it's not just praying passive prayers, but that's that component of a, a prayer that is longing for a face-to-face -face interaction with God. We know that there's not that texting doesn't quite is not quite the same as a phone call. And we know a phone call is not quite the same as a face-to-face -face interaction. Because with each of those levels of interaction, there is a personal and deeper interaction and, and a, a connection with that individual. And in prayer, it's like, God, I, I don't want to settle for texting with you, God. Just relaying info. God, I, I don't want to just let it be my tone that you hear. But God, I, I want you to see my face. And God, I want to see your face. Like the psalmist said, it was read earlier. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. That's the prayer of the desperate. Few things express our longing for God like prayer and fasting. Over the next two weeks, I want to challenge us all to fast and pray. Fasting is to withhold something we enjoy for the sake of pursuing God whom we long for to enjoy more. Oftentimes, fasting is to withhold certain kinds of food or food altogether. Others have fasted from different distractions, whether it be social media or sports. Netflix, whatever it is, you know what it is that takes your face away from God. Yes. Yes. I, mean, I just want to say over the next two weeks, carve out times, have a strategy for prayer, a strategy for fasting. Maybe say, these three days I'm going to withhold from food. Maybe those three days I'm going to withhold from social media. Whatever it is, let it be intentional as a way of saying, God, we're broken. God, I'm broken. I'm going to humble myself before you. I'm going to long for you more than I long for food. Seek my face. And the fourth thing he says is to turn from their wicked ways. See, to humble ourselves, to pray and seek God's face, but to savor our sin is to be a contradiction. You see, we can't seek God and savor our sin. See, turning to the one necessitates the turning from the other. You hear that again? It's not the army. To savor our sin and seek God can't happen. Because to turn from the one necessitates the turning from the other. So if you'll turn from sin, turn to sin, I'm sorry, it will necessitate turning away from God. But if you turn to God, it necessitates turning away from sin. But you can't turn to both at the same time. And so God's like, look, if my people are really humble themselves, you got to turn from your wicked ways. And this is the hard check we've all got to do that probably none of us wants to do. Yeah. Psalm 139 is a prayer. I try to pray often. Yeah. Verse 27 and 28 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. That's scary. Yeah. Try me then and know my thoughts. That's scary. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And then lead me in the way that's everlasting. And oftentimes I pray that prayer. I say, God, show me my heart. And I'm like, I don't want to see that. God, show me my thoughts. Ooh, I did think that, didn't I? How to turn from these wicked ways. Lead me in the way that's everlasting. See, God knows your heart and he knows your thoughts. He's not surprised when you pray, man. But we've got to articulate our heart and articulate our thoughts. Not so that we can let God know what's going on. Well, so that we can start acknowledging and begin the process of humbling ourselves and turning to Him. These are four indispensable actions in prayer. But the God who made nature also has corresponding reaction to our prayer. The action of genuine prayer is mercifully met with the reaction of a generous God. You're with me, family. This is the good news that we come to. As we come to God with our brokenness, we are met with a God who is generous, family. You see, the laws of nature, when a bird flies up, the action of a bird flapping his wings is pushing the air down so the bird can go up. But the corresponding reaction of the bird going up is the air going down. And the action of our prayers going up have a corresponding reaction of God's blessing coming down. Yeah. And what does this blessing look like? He says, if the people do this, the corresponding condition and this conditional statement is, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Look, he says, I'm going to hear from heaven. 
lot of times when we're facing trials in our land and our lives, we tend to think that God is no longer on His throne. And God's like, it's not that I'm not on my throne. I'm here in my throne. That's why you're going through what you're going through. But the good news of it is that because I'm on my throne, I can get you through what you're going through. I'm in heaven. I hear your prayers. You need proof of that? And God goes to Moses at that burning bush. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard them. Or in Elijah, with Elijah on the mountain of Carmel, he cries out, Answer me, O Lord, answer me. God sends them fire. Yeah. When Zechariah and Elizabeth cried out to God, God comes to Zechariah in Luke 1. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. God is not dull to the prayers of his people who are coming with a humble heart. Praying, seeking his face, and turning away from their wicked ways. And not only does he hear, but then he forgives your sins and brings healing to our land. How oh, we're broken, family. God knows how to put us back together. America is broken, family. God can put his church back together to make a difference in America. But it all begins with a relationship with Jesus. See, sin, that's any rebellion toward God and word or thought, has fractured, severed our friendship and fellowship with God. If we've never received God's forgiveness, that, that severing is an eternal separation. There is a chasm that exists between you and God, a chasm no one can jump, a chasm no one can swim. But only Jesus can break that for you. When he went to the cross, he took your sin, he took your shame, he took your guilt to make healing with God possible. So you can be forgiven, brought into God's family, and experience new life, eternal life. That's a, that's a promise. If you are a child of God, I want us to understand something. While our eternal life is secure based on Jesus, Let's remember, though, that our fellowship with God can be fractured. Amen. Our sin has a way of, of harming our, our fellowship with God. That's why we got to come and say, God, I want oneness with you again. Let's cry out to you. And so this conditional statement of if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That conditional statement is met with a then I will hear and forgive and heal. Family, as I close with this message, I want us to be the kind of people that understand that God invites us. He summons us. He has sent that letter in your mail. He's saying, come. What is it in your heart that you need to bring before him? Over the next two weeks, I want you to just make a list of those things. The things that burden you, the things that you believe are pulling you away from God. And bring that before Him with humility, with prayer, and with fasting, and say, God, meet us in that place. Heal our land, oh God. So let's identify what God is telling us, what the Holy Spirit is telling you, and then prioritize what He's telling you. Family, this is the sure road for restoration and revival for all times. So let's be the people that pray and then be the people who experience God's forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Well, after I pray here, we're going to invite a prayer team to come forward. And maybe today is that first step for you. <coughs> prayer team comes every week to the right and to the left of the stage. And they're just eager to pray with you. They're not people who got life all together. But they're people just as broken as you and I are. But there are people who are hungry to pray with you. And they don't want you, and we don't want you. God doesn't want you to leave this place without having really brought before Him the burden of your heart. And so, would you rise to your feet as I close the prayer and worship team as you come on the stage? Let's pray together. <laughs>